Hi, Deb Benal here, teaching artist with the Southern Alleghenies Museum of Art and the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts. Welcome to Sunlight and Hope. We will be repainting a landscape painting I did that I really like, but I want to try some, some different things with it. The topics we'll cover include nature is painted with light. I'm a big fan of Celtic knotwork. The green problem. Did you know there was a green problem? There might be. Color wheel revision. A more scientific version of the color wheel. And mainly working with a limited palette. This will turn out to be quite a challenge, but it's also fun. Nature is painted with light. Are you a landscape artist? Sometimes, maybe all the time? Are you inspired by nature? Well, artists are at a little bit of a disadvantage when compared to nature. She's painting with sunlight. She has all the three-dimensional surfaces in the world. She has scent, auditory, tactile sensations. We have a flat surface that we are squirting pigment out of tubes and trying to depict how we feel about nature. It's okay, it still intrigues us and we still keep trying. This is a painting I did several years ago called Sanctuary. And it was started in the backyard of a Mennonite family where I was doing this plein air painting. I was painting it on the spot and what I loved was their backyard had no grass, it had all this moss. It was really thick, spongy, bright green moss. And I was just intrigued with painting it and it was very peaceful. Well, all of a sudden, the light is always changing when you're painting outside, but all of a sudden, the sun really came out and started streaming through the trees and casting these lights onto the ground. This is an actual photograph I took at that moment when I was pretty well done with my little painting and I decided to use this, use the sunlight streaming in. It reminded me of being in a church except in nature and I made this painting that I called Sanctuary. I included a Celtic cross in it because I just love doing that Celtic knot work and I tried to make it subtle enough so that you first just see nature and if you look close you see the cross. And I got the idea of getting involved with Celtic knotwork when my family went to Ireland in 2011 and we visited Trinity College in Dublin and we saw the Book of Kells. The Book of Kells is an illustrated manuscript of the first four Gospels and of the four Gospels. And it is very intricate. Some of these Celtic knots are so precise and so tiny, you'd think the monks were painting with, with one brush. And when we got to the gift shop, I saw this book that had so many references for Celtic knots. And it was made by this artist and art teacher named George Bain. And he really researched the stuff. He went to all these ancient prehistoric sites and he drew samples of all these different symbolisms and knots and swirls and designs and it's just a wonderful reference book you can get it in the united states through dover publishing here are the pages where i found the reference for the cross and it's just a square that can connect with another square or it can end it could be a standalone square and the neat thing about this cross and many Celtic knot works is it never ends. You start at one point and keep on going. This is the one I chose for the new painting, Hope. I wanted it to not be a Christian symbol, but to be a more universal symbol, but still spiritual. So I doodled around with it, came up with my own version of it, figured out which lines cross which, and made a little quadrant of it on tracing paper which I then applied to the canvas board, flipping it three more times, so I ended up with the Celtic knot where I wanted it. 
I have another book for you too. You get two book reviews in this one video. This book I wish I had when I was a student in college studying painting. It's just a fabulous reference book for the use of color and light in painting. It's done by an artist named James Gurney, and besides doing the series Dinotopia, he was an illustrator for National Geographic, and he's a great painter. The next several ideas in this video come from that book. Color Wheel Revision. Now you say, why do we need to revise the color wheel? It is such a basic component of what we've been taught as artists and painters that red, blue, and yellow, those are our primaries. The other colors are secondaries because they're mixed from the primaries. Yeah, it doesn't really work with the pigments we use, but, but hey, it sort of works. Well, if this was so good, why don't printers use blue, red, and yellow? Why do they use cyan, magenta, and yellow? There's cyan, magenta, and yellow, and they are equidistant on this color wheel. They, they would form the main triangle. And of course, printers add black to get the really deep colors. But in this color wheel, blue and red are still here. Red is halfway between magenta and yellow, and blue is halfway between cyan and magenta. And no color is really considered a primary or secondary. All the colors around the edge, all the bright full strength pigments are as important as each other. The thing this helps you with is what are really complements of each other. And here you can see cyan and red are across from each other. And when I painted this red, going into the middle, I added a little bit of cyan, a little bit more each step until it turns out to be a fairly neutral gray, a cool gray. And that was the case for every pair of complements on this chart. Some were warmer grays, some were cooler grays. The only one it didn't work great for was the blue and the yellow. They turned into a greenish gray, which could be just due to the pigments I was using or the fact that I didn't spend days and days doing this chart. But what I did was really informative. So if you want to have a little better handle on what complements a color exactly, you may want to refer to this more scientific version of the color wheel. James Gurney calls this color wheel the Yermby color wheel. And the initials YRMBCG which stand for yellow, red, magenta, blue, cyan, green, aren't that memorable unless you think of this phrase, you ride my bus, cousin Gus. The green problem. You might say, what? There's a green problem? It's like our most popular color on earth. Just look out at nature. And the human eye is more sensitive to the yellow green part of the spectrum than any other part. Well, let's take a look at some paintings by the Hudson River School of Painters and see what they thought about green. Now, these paintings you've probably seen in museums, they would be the huge panoramic landscapes that are just filled with light and wonder. And if you go up close, it's like they painted every little leaf on the tree. Let's take a look at them. Okay, it does look like some pretty fabulous painters leaned away from using very harsh shades of green. But who else? Who else thinks green is bad? Well, book cover designers for one, it's known that a book with a green cover does not sell as well as other colors of book covers. There are costume designers for the stage 
who stay away from green because it looks very bad under stage lighting. And gallery directors who sell artists' paintings say that it's sometimes hard to sell a painting that has an overall green cast, that they have to be careful about it, light it with care. So there seem to be a lot of problems with green. So here I am with my phthalo green, the brightest, baddest green in the paint box, and adding yellow to it makes it glow even more. And it's just when you want green, 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 and you're just inspired by the intensity of the greens in the landscape, maybe it's not the best thing. I still like this painting, but in my painting that will be done in this video, I'm going to get away from the phthalo green and try to tone down the greens and let other colors have a say in the landscape. We'll see how that goes. Working with a limited palette. I'm going to be using just four colors plus white in this painting, if all goes as planned. And the colors are, I have the three primaries in a version of themselves. Burnt Sienna for red, it's a reddish brown. Turquoise Deep for my blue. And for my yellow, this crazy color called Nickel Azo Yellow. And it looks brownish or goldish yellow, but it, it can be quite bright. And then just in case I need some depth, I'm going to use my good old dioxazine purple. And I plan to use mostly mixtures of these colors. Rarely will you see one of these colors alone in the painting. Let's add some white to them and see what we get. There's a, the yellow that has a nice glow to it. Let's do the Red Sienna next. Makes me wonder if I'm gonna miss red, but we'll see. And this is, ah, oh, it's just a gorgeous, gorgeous aquaish color. And it will have some nice blue shades mixed with the dioxazine purple. Let's take the purple into the aquaish. Look at that rich blue we're getting. That is nice. And we can, ooh, gray blue. That's very nice. So what does the teal do with the burnt sienna? Ooh, it's a, like you can get a deep forest green. That is very nice. Oh, a sage green. I'm liking it. What does the yellow do to that green? Ooh, that's a nice natural looking green. What does the yellow do with burnt sienna? Oh, almost like a, a raw sienna. Hmm, tannish color. And we know this should neutralize each other, the purple and the, uh, the yellow. I'm expecting some sort of brown. Yeah, that's a nice brown. We can adjust that with this brown. There are endless possibilities here. Okay, I think we can make sort of a, a color wheel with these. Let's just make a version with some white. So we'll put the purple down here. We'll make them equidistant apart. Put the, yeah, just put the yellow over here. Oops, my brush was a little dirty. Put the yellow right there. And the uh, teal here. And the burnt sienna. Some paint companies make a burnt sienna that is uh, wimpier than this. This is not as transparent as some, and it's pretty deep and rich for a burnt sienna. So there are my four colors. Now what do we get 
let's do the yellow before things get um, dirty, before the water gets too dirty. And I'm expecting a nice green in there. Yeah. And we'll put some white in the middle and add that to the green. Oh yeah. And some, some white traveling to the yellow. And some white traveling to the blue. Okay. Now what about between the blue, the turquoise, and the burnt sienna? Let's get some more fresh turquoise on there. And some fresh burnt sienna. Some white. And a little more intense color there. For the limited palette, I, I kind of picked some of my favorite colors. So I think it has the potential for, for brightness if I want it. But I'm going to try to see if I can get a more mellow feeling, like a dreamlike feeling is what I'm going for in this landscape. Oh, look at that mauvish color with the, uh, the burnt sienna. Isn't that neat? Let me get some more. more burnt sienna. That purple is overpowering it there. That's pretty good. Okay, let's drag some light into various areas here. This painting will have a lot of darks, um, a lot of darks in it. I might want to experiment with my darks in addition to that. Okay, now we just have the area between yellow and purple to go. Oh, that's a nice, that's a nice rich brown, isn't it? It'll contrast with the burnt sienna, the reddish brown. Yeah, now that yellow azo really knocks back the purple quickly, more quickly than a, uh, a cadmium yellow. That's pretty nice. Okay, now we haven't seen what purple and aqua-ish do. Well, we did on the palette. It's a deep, rich blue. So now, now things are getting out of order, but at least we'll be able to see what colors we have available. That that is really nice. What about, well, we can guess what these two colors do. And uh, yeah, that's the only one I was really wondering about. So, there is the gamut of colors for this painting. What if the shadow was even more purplish? And what if you didn't want it to be bright purple, you wanted it to be dull purple? I'm going to have to use restraint here. I like some of these colors straight out of the tube, but that's getting to be an interesting color. It has some... Oh, I love that. That's going to be a good shadow color. Okay, I think I'm about ready to start painting. Actually, knowing that the painting has a lot of deep colors in, I messed around with this a little more to get some of those shadowy colors and see what all mixtures I could get. And I think this gives a better idea of the colors that will actually be in the painting. Around the edge, I just used a little bit of white with the colors just to show up how they looked when they're bright. Now I think we're ready. So here I am painting the image onto the canvas board. The Celtic knot was already there, because I knew where I wanted it to be located on that tree. And I'm using a grid that I had on the reference photograph and on the canvas to get things in the right spots. 
I'm going to get those sun streaks in there on the lower right hand corner. And now you can see the finished drawing all ready to paint. Here's the thumbnail painting I did. So I have a plan of where I'm going with these colors. It was really good I did this because I started getting used to what these colors do when they're mixed with each other. And I ended up often mixing mixtures of three or four of them to get what I wanted. So I started getting the idea that this might not be as easy as I thought. Actually, there's not a lot of pressure for putting on the first coat. I'm going to get the colors as close as I can, but not get nuts about it because I know there's a second and third and, and maybe even fourth pass over to get things to where I want them. So I'm starting with some great blue greens in the background. That dioxazine purple and turquoise deep really make a nice bluish green. And then if you use the right mixture of them, you get a nice blue for the sky. So it can tend blue or green. I'm not getting real detailed with the foliage in the background. That'll be for a later pass. Now getting down to the foreground. I think I went a little fast on here. I didn't pay much attention to the thumbnail when I got down here. I just wanted to get some color on every part in the board turning it upside down to get better access to the Celtic knot, which is fairly detailed and takes some time. I'm making it darker as it goes over any tree so you can a little bit see what's happening behind the knot. And here is the first pass. The yellow is a little bit harsh looking. Some of it needs to be light green. The green itself needs to be deeper and richer in the foreground. Not sure I like the brown in the middle ground. The Celtic knot is very pastel looking to me, like unicorn colors or something. Nothing against unicorns. I was a unicorn actually myself for a while in elementary school. But it's a good start, a lot of work to do yet. Here is the second pass over the whole painting. In theory, if I made all the right decisions, I could complete it in this pass. You know that's not going to happen. But I'll get closer. I'll get closer to what I intended. I'm increasing the intensity of the greens down at the bottom. They were kind of washed out the first time through. And making the brown part a little smaller, I'm still going to end up with some orange back there. I'm not doing too much to the Celtic knot in this pass, except maybe emphasizing the in-between areas, so it, it's going to get more defined. You can tell I'm looking at the thumbnail more than I am the, um, the reference photo now. I have it closer to me. I will be putting in some more lacy foliage also. Getting those little dots of leaves in there, those are fun. emphasizing the corners and the top, like darkening them, so there's a little bit of framing going on within the painting to keep your eye traveling toward the middle of the painting. The cool design thing is those yellowish streaks of sun pointing toward the Celtic knot. Here come those leaves.
I'm defining that line where the, the wood starts a little bit more. And lo and behold, I've done a compositional no-no. I've almost divided my canvas in half. But you know, those rules are made to be broken and I'm breaking it with this painting. I like everything above the line and I like everything below the line and they're gonna work together. So without any addition to the Celtic knot itself, here is the painting. Still a little bit of orange back there. Not liking it, but the yellow's looking better. Maybe it's not big enough. Meaning that I want the yellow streaks to shoot into the picture more. I want them to extend further into the middle part of the picture. So what I did was paint them in in white to cover up the green so I could put yellow on it and the yellow is transparent so being over white works better. For the yellow in the background I actually added a tiny bit of purple to make it a little more dull and then it only got bright yellow when that one in the foreground gets painted yellow and then over toward the left it starts getting green again because it's in the shadow. I worked on that brown part, put some more aquaish colors in the middle section. And just a bunch of final little touches of things that I thought needed worked on. Here is the third pass through. And the painting's actually more blue than this. I must have photographed this in a warmer light. But it's getting there. I think I might want to make the right hand side of the Celtic knot some warmer colors eventually. Here is the fourth pass in which I emphasized the greens down below a little more, made them more dramatic. I still didn't fix that Celtic knot, so guess what? There's going to be a fifth pass, but that will be the end, I promise. So here is Hope with a limited palette. I am just amazed at how much more colorful it is than the original with an unlimited palette. Let's take a closer look. Here's my original painting. There are at least a dozen colors of paint used in this painting, plus white. Compare that to the new painting in which we used four colors plus white. And we seem to get more of a variety of color in it. Isn't that something? Of course, if you look close at this old painting, you can see some of the very bright colors. There are oranges, there's magenta, there's some phthalo blue, lots of purple and ultramarine blue, some bright oranges. And just the limited palette. I think that's pretty amazing and I think I will continue to experiment with limited palettes. Mm -hmm.